What up, pimps? There's a throwback. So anyway, I've got this Tupperware full of uh, Game Boy parts. I think we're gonna build build me a Game Boy. Um, you'll have to forgive me. I'm sure you already know what this is after reading the, uh, the title. But you'll have to forgive me because I have done a little bit of the work ahead of time on account of me wanting to make sure that the build that I'm doing is gonna actually work. Um, I've done some test fitting. I actually, I didn't have the correct buttons that Zypher says to use, so I went ahead and modified some that I had, and got those to work, so I'm gonna skip that step. I already have buttons that work. Um, the buttons he says to get are probably better than the ones I have, but the ones I have had the benefit of me having them. <laughs> so that's that's what I installed. But anyway, this is Zypher's slab, not to be confused with Boxy Pixels Unhinged or my slate. Um, but it is more or less the same concept. You take an SP, you put it in a new shell that is in a uh, candy bar form factor similar to the original Game Boys, and that's that's it. Uh, the twist on Zypher's design is that the SP board is mounted upside down within the shell so that the cart slot is facing up, which a lot of people seem to um, obsess over, and personally I didn't think it was worth the effort for how much you have to rewire to flip that around, but Zypher has done uh, some pretty clever designs here and there, and I think he made it work. I haven't actually assembled this yet, aside from some test fits here and there, so let's try it out, why don't we? So I had most of this thing printed with Shapeways, the uh, Shapeways, PCBways clear. Uh, what is that like UTR eighty one hundred or eighty three hundred or something? Uh, and then they put a lacquer finish on it. They didn't want to print all of the parts because their minimum print dimensions for some parts is. 0.8 millimeters and Zypher opted to use 0.6 millimeters in some places. Uh, so the two black parts I ended up getting printed at Shapeways. Three black parts, excuse me. Um, every other part was printed through PCB way. This was not the cheapest print, but I, I wanted to make a clear one. And then PCB way dashed all my hopes. And I quite frankly didn't Feel like editing it so I didn't but nonetheless here we go as you can see I've got quite a few screen options I couldn't decide um, I had these buttons on my desk from when I fixed this SP as you may recall this SP was going to go into a Game Boy Pocket shell and I was gonna do well, no, it was going to go into a Game Boy Pocket Shell. That's, that's what it was. I'll throw a link to the premiere that I did on that down in the description. Um, that ended up not working out. I put the project in a box for at least three years, and then I circled back to it last week, this week, earlier, and recently fixed this. And the goal is to put it in this shell, which is also based on a Game Boy Pocket. So in some circular manner. It is still going into a Game Boy Pocket, just not the way I had originally envisioned. Um, but anyway, I had these buttons on the desk because it was a DMG style shell, and the shell, it's gone. I cut that thing up. But I was looking at it with these buttons, and then I was looking at that other screen that I just did a video on, that uh, mirror lens one, and I was thinking, you know what, that would look that would look pretty cool in this clear, almost uh, Famitsu-looking design. But then I happened upon something even better, and yes, I'm, ooh, I'm throwing it everywhere. Don't do that with your kids. Yeah, I know, it's not a very fancy design, but bear with me. 
Notice this is a Game Boy Advance kit. And I've got this weird ribbon attached to it. Well, this just so happens to fit without having to do any funky uh, I had this somehow this might be upside down. I, I might be I might have this backwards I gotta no I don't remember how I did it but I got it to fit there was a bend and it was easier than <clears throat> It's easier than soldering up that custom cable that Zypher recommends, but we'll we'll get to that later because I got to do all the buttons and stuff first. Uh, so, even though I think this would look better, I think we're going to go this route because this should be a lot easier to install. And I'm probably not going to use this one because I don't know that brightness controls work on this. And if I'm using a Game Boy Advance kit, I might as well use one with working brightness controls uh, as opposed to a Game Boy Advance SP kit, which doesn't fit the ribbon just quite frankly not long enough if we put that in there yeah it doesn't even without the bend it doesn't go high enough so and then I had an AGS 101 screen because I wanted to show one of the cool features with Zypher's slate was that it slabbed Ooh, excuse me probably gonna do that several more times it's not intentional <laughs> One of the cool features with Zypher Slab uh, is that it does work with OEM AGS 101 screens uh, if you happen to want to reshell one of those. Uh, the problem in this particular case is that this screen is busted and you have to get a different back piece. I only got the back piece for the IPS so I can't do this if I wanted to. It just it does not fit. The spacing is different so we'll do that later. Anywho. Let us move on. So you will need for one of these builds one of Zypher's pocket common ground boards or any other common ground board meant for the pocket. The screw spacing is based off of the Game Boy Pocket so anything that's designed to install in the Game Boy Pocket should work as well. Um, one, one thing of note with Zypher's pocket board in specific uh, is that the audio is wired up incorrectly on this. Uh, I don't know that it'll make that huge of a difference, but if we take multimeter here, put it on continuity mode, so it beeps, oop, continuity mode, there we go. Uh, sorry, it's probably a little bit quiet. This is the ground right here. This is wired up to the audio ground. I can't really test. It's on the other side. You'll have to... Oh, there's a there's a pin right there. You see, beep, beep, beep. Alright. If we look at the actual uh, Game Boy Advance board, I'm going to take this one that's not all cut up. We're going to probe out the speaker to ground. You notice none of these go to ground. The audio ground and the system ground are not the same plane. And this is a working ground. Oh my god, this is not a working ground. Well, that's embarrassing. Either way, I know that's a working ground. Notice these are not connected. I can try other grounds on the board. It's connected. That's not a ground. One of these should be a ground. There we go. Notice beeps for a second, but then it switches off. That means we don't have full continuity. I don't know enough about audio to explain why it beeps for a second, but I know enough about audio to know that I don't know enough about audio to know that we're not gonna use common ground. So instead, point of that being, since the speaker doesn't sit here on the board anyway, it sits basically over here, I think, No, it sits right here. Um, we have to solder it on anyway. I'm just going to solder it straight to the SP instead of soldering it to the common ground board. It will make the wiring slightly more complicated to manage, but I think it should be good. I'm probably going to use this speaker anyway since it just fits. Uh, it's a little, little small, so it might wiggle around. I might have to like tape it in or something. 
Um, one of the uh, Game Boy Pocket speakers might actually be pretty cool from Funny Playing, the clear, especially in this build, but I might actually have one. I'll, I'll look for that later when we get to it. Anyway, lots of rambling. Let's go ahead and get started with the build. So this is fully 3D printed. I did already go ahead and install the buttons and they're kind of a pain in the butt to get out, so I'm not gonna try. Uh, but these are modified. These were originally, they weren't these shoulder buttons, but you could see how with these shoulder buttons there's these extra metal bits for reinforcement and mounting. Well, these had that and I had to cut that off. I also unbent the pins and then promptly broke them on both of them. I did both pins on one of them and then I broke one pin on the other and then I just decided, well, screw it, I've already broken three, what's four? <laughs> uh, but yeah, after cutting off all the tabs, I got it to fit, but then the little nubbin was slightly too long, so I had to cut that too, but everything is good now. So let's start the install. We need this shielding. It goes on same as a stock SP right there. I'm going to break out the screws here. And I am going to use mostly tri-wing screws because that is what I have a ton of. Though for the external screws, I might pick some Torx. But should be able to just thread those in. This is the wrong size. Let's start off by destroying some cheap aftermarket screws. What do you say? And the difficulty to thread this will depend entirely upon your specific 3D print. Uh, this is one of those uh, lacquer coated prints from PCB Way, like I mentioned. Not sponsored, by the way, I just like these prints. Um, and unfortunately, that does mess with the tolerances a little bit. Also, this thing arrived totally warped. As you can see, it's very flexible. These 3D prints, especially, especially this one, was warped. but. You can still see it's a little bit warped. I'm hoping by the time it screws together that should work itself out. Um, but you can you can hit these with hot air, like with your hot air station. It doesn't melt, per se. I don't know, I have I usually hit it with like 300 degree air and that doesn't melt it. Um, but once it's nice and hot, it gets very pliable and you can just hold it in shape and it'll keep that shape once it cools down. That's what I did with this. I hit it with hot air and then just pressed it up against my desk flat and it mostly held the shape. But unfortunately that is the price we pay if we want clear. Anyway, that should be good. And that should fit. There we go. All right, so now we will need to wire up the buttons. Uh, actually, let us put in the battery cover. Zypher says to glue this in, and it's probably a good idea, but I'm not gonna do that with the clear shell because I don't wanna mess up the finish. Once it's all screwed together, it shouldn't go anywhere. I will need to attach a battery thinger. All right. And shoot, while we're at it, let's pop a new LED in this bad boy. So just a uh, proof 
concept there. Ta-da! Oh. Ta-da! While we're here, let's drop a new LED in this thing. Why not? It's a clear shell. We'll see it. All right, now let us discuss LED orientation. I like this meter, don't get me wrong, but it's kind of big, and for what I normally use it for, it's not quite what I want. So if we put that into diode mode, oh shoot, I bent my probe. No, see, that's not doing it either. This is what I get for not knowing how to use my multimeter. That's what I want. There we go. Helps if you put it in the right spot. All right, so there we go. That's what I wanted. It's kind of hard to see. I'll zoom in nice and close. When we probe this out, you can see the LEDs lighten up. So the reason that's important, and I think I'll do a video on multimeters at some point just so we can go over that more in depth. By the way, you want common, common is the negative, and on this meter, I guess, that is the uh, red one where you want to put that. Uh, but you might want to put it over here depending on what you're doing or even over here depending on what you're doing. But for this, that's what we want. I would know that had I read the manual. I didn't read the manual. But anyway, we put it over to diode mode. That's the little option with the diode. And on this particular meter, it defaults in this setting to um, resistance. So we have to hit the mode button to bring it over into diode mode. And then when we probe that, we can see it lights up. Now, if we were to probe the other way around, you could see, well, or maybe not. Uh, you'll have to take my word for it. It's not lighting up this way because I have the ground probe on the wrong side. The reason we do this is so that we can determine what the polarity of the LED is. We can see that the outside pin or pad is the ground pad on the SP. You can also tell that just by looking at the little um, icon right there, but not every board is as helpfully labeled as Game Boy boards are. Um, so let us grab the new LED. Actually, I'm going to go ahead and remove this one first. Uh, the easiest way to remove an LED is, of course, with a big old solder ball. And before I do that, I am going to... I don't want to get solder on this gold pad. At the end of the day, it really, really doesn't matter. But because I don't want to get solder on that, I'm going to show you how to do how to not do that too. I'm going to take a little bit of Captain and heat resistance is very important here so it has to be Captain. Um, actually that's not true. I've used what's that blue tape? The masking tape? I've used that before. I wouldn't recommend people do that but I'm just saying, I've done it before and it worked for me. I am going to put Captain over what I don't want to solder to. Now I'm going to remove it, take my soldering iron. I am going to hit both sides, solder. Because 
the nice juicy leaded solder. And if you hit both sides and keep going back and forth fast enough, you might be able to desolder it that way. But an even easier way is to just use a solder ball, a big old solder ball, that'll hit both sides, and then you can just wipe it off. Problem is, that'll destroy the LED, but in this case, we don't really care about that, do we? And there we go, it is removed. I'm going to touch up that pad, that pad, and let us get the new LED. Got half an hour in, I haven't even started on the slate itself yet, or slab. Oh, I keep doing that. Habits, sorry. I think. For this particular build, red would make the most sense, but I don't I don't have red. I also just dropped the LED. Is that it? I don't think that's it. I think that's the one I desoldered. Yeah, that's the one I desoldered. Well, such is life. That's why you buy spares. Do I have white? No, I have pink. Let's do pink. I've done blue already. I've done pink already, but... I have a lot more pink. <laughs> Take two. Fill that up. Dump that out. Alright. And if we look at the bottom of this LED, might be able to see. Apologies, it is very tiny. Let's see if we can do that. Want to focus for me? On the hand. There we go. There we go. You can sort of see that. You can see there's this uh, T shape and it's kind of like pointing to that pad. Usually the pad it's pointing to is the ground. And forgive me because I forget this every single time. But we can test it. Same way we tested the original LED. Keep the meter in diode mode. And just try and poke both sides and see if it lights up. Ta-da! So that's the way we want to solder it. And yes, I was correct. The T shape does point to the ground. So I am going to solder this down. Just do one side, flip it over. Do the other side. And I am going to leave that like that. Because LEDs are very sensitive to heat, we do not want to overheat that. But we do want to test it. Ta-da! Hopefully I didn't melt the uh, low power LED, and I sincerely doubt I even touched the charge LED. but that's good too. It switched off because I'm holding the battery in and I wasn't <laughs> when I plugged that in. Um, go ahead and remove the captain now. You can see I didn't get any solder on that gold pad, which is what I was going for. 
And we are done with the big meter. Now, the reason that not all multimeters will light up an LED in diode mode, uh, well, there's, there's two reasons why that might happen. Um, I'll go more into detail on this in another video, but for the most part, it has to do with how the diode or how the multimeter is built to test diodes, uh, but also how the multimeter is actually powered. So that big multimeter is powered by, I think, four AAAs, uh, and the little one is powered by a little coin cell. Something, one of these bad boys. So it just doesn't have the power. So it doesn't spare any. Anyway. Let's do buttons now. After all that, oh, there's still a battery in there. That's not bad. I believe we can just leave this in here and continue assembly. Uh, we probably don't want to run the wires for these buttons over top, but the alternative is we have to run them behind the card slot. So I think I'm just gonna run them over top, call it a day. Oh no, I shouldn't. I'll do it the proper way. I'm gonna do it with magnet wire though. So I'm probably gonna fast forward through a lot of this video because otherwise this is going to be a very long video and I don't have the time for that. I mean, I guess I do, but you guys probably don't. You've all seen me solder. But to prepare the magnet wire, I am going to use my little fiberglass scratch pen. And I should be able to tin the end of that. And I highly recommend not soldering these in the shell, but like I said, they're already in there. I'm kind of committed. Uh, and also because the SP uses a common ground for the buttons, I'm just going to daisy chain these because it'll make the wiring a lot easier. Thankfully this is not PETG or PLA or that would have melted. There we go. Wire the first button in. And then I am literally going to run that across to there, and then we'll run that with the other button. I'm going to have to glue that down, or and just tuck it under the shielding. I don't know. Doesn't matter. You get the idea.
Ta da! So now don't forget because the board is rotated, we have to also swap the position of the uh, shoulder buttons. We also don't want that. Um, I might not have made them long enough to route around. But the idea was we could route like that around the screw holes. And then behind the cart slot. On the one hand, I don't really want these running around right next to the CPU, but on the other hand, kind of made my wires too short to not do that, so. Yeah, that'll work. And then look at that, you can't even tell that I abused <laughs> wire routing. All right, because these wires have a layer of uh, enamel, they shouldn't short on anything, but just to double check. Is that? And seems fine. So I am going to keep it that way. Also going to route this around the screw hole. Because I forgot to do that before I laid it down. move on. That was a lot. Okay, so now we need to I want this to open up like this, which means the wiring for this speaker really doesn't have to be that long. Uh, now, regardless of what y'all think, um, I don't want to be soldering to spring contact pads, so I am going to try and solder to those little vias right next to them. Uh, so to avoid soldering to those spring contact pads, I am going to use more Captain Tape. And the reason I don't want to solder to those spring contact pads is because whenever possible I like to make my mods reversible. Um, obviously that didn't happen here. But, with an SP, or with any gold-plated contact pads in general, not just an SP, um, once you get solder on the gold, it's there permanently. Solder is not very conductive, it'll form an oxide layer. I mean, it, it is conductive, just the outside layer isn't. Uh, and we don't want that if I ever try rolling this back. I probably won't, but I like having the option. I'm not having a very good time. You gotta scratch up some of the 
epoxy, but not all of it. On for these two itty bitty vias right above those pads. So the reason I'm having such a hard time right now is because Nintendo uses plated vias or plated um, tented. There we go, tented vias, which means this green solder resistant mask goes over these. Usually it doesn't go in them, so that's why most of the time you're able to solder to them without scratching them. But the problem here is that they're so small I can't I can't get in there. I'm thinking this might be futile. Might have to sod to those pads anyway. All right, yeah. Unfortunately, that's where we're at. If this weren't the SP that I was so uh, that I butchered so, put it that way, then this would be more important to me. But since since this thing has been so heavily used and abused, I think I think it'll just have to work. wires here are a little bit long, but I fear if I trim them I'll make them too short, so that's where they're at. It's not the end of the world, though. More slack is fine, all things considered. Alright, so now we want to... solder up the common ground board, which I have somehow misplaced. Never mind, I found it. It's right here. So again, we're not going to use any of the speaker pads. Uh, would be pretty cool if this had the gold terminals there so you could just drop the speaker in, but I guess Zypher didn't, didn't go that route. So... We'll do it this way. I'm going to go ahead and tin up all these. And because I want this to open up like a book, I'm going to try and get enough slack wire to do so. That'll go up and around, and we want that that far. You can trim if necessary. Here we go. I'm using, of course, this 80 conductor IDE cable that I have been cutting off of for a very long time. and get this prepared by stripping it down. What I'm going to do is I'm going to separate out each wire and I'm going to strip the ends and then I'm going to solder them. So I'll be back in just a sec.
So there we go. Got them all soldered down nicely. I'm gonna end up, ooh, I didn't get them all soldered down. Glad I checked. That one is not soldered. Did the old Ven test. Now they're all soldered down. And the problem is, there's no real good place to get ground. I think I'm just going to scratch the spot and grab it right from the right from the back there, because the pad that Zypher wants you to use is right there, and I don't, I don't know. That just seems kind of far away. I also have an extra wire, so I miscounted. I'm gonna remove that. I'm just gonna scratch the hole. Right there. And there we go. That is all nice and soldered. And if I want to, I can go ahead and screw this down now. And I think I'm going to do exactly that. It's going to make a little inconvenient doing the wiring, but I'll figure something out. Screwing this down will make handling this thing so much easier. I think there's room for one more screw there. All right. So I have another board. I'm just gonna follow the uh, wiring that. So this, go backwards, and 
I need to find... I'm going to start by going right to left. I need the up test pad. There, I'll link a... I'll probably link the exact same thing that Zypher links. Um, check out his video. He has a wiring diagram. Uh, we want... For up, we want TP6. And that's up here. Actually, all four of them are up here. So up, down, left, right. We want one, two, three, four. And if it helps, Zypher's wiring diagram is wired in the exact same order. So you, if you follow his diagram, top to bottom, you'll be wiring it right to left like I am. Five, six, seven, four, two, seven, six, four, and seven. So we're gonna start with up, which is 2 Then we'll go left, which is 2 5 Should have done the first, but through the door. Left, down, to 7 Right, to 4 we're gonna right first, then down. No, I did that first. That's okay. Good job, sorry. I'll use my hands on my. Let's do this one first. Alright, that's fine. That's fine. Right there. Alright, next up we need select and start. Which are 2, 2, 3. They're right here. 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 Okay, I'm there we go. And then left, left, last. It's AD and ground. Which are the TT1 and TT0, which are right there, and there. E, T1, okay. Don't think I'm sorry, because I am customizing these mates. So that's not how to do that. That's what I'm going to do with that. Alright, right, 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 And then we just have a ground, which I can put right here. Ooh, I don't want to do that. There's something soldered to the other side of that. I suppose we can use the battery minus ta um, test point. Here is the third multimeter I'm going to break out. But I like this one because you just switch it on, it's already in the mode. Beeps nice and quick. There's what I'm pretty sure is ground, and that is shorted to ground. So, Ooh! I have one of the buttons wired wrong. I'm going to have to fix that. That's unfortunate. Oh well. Such is life. Alright, so we're going to use the battery minus test pad for ground because my wire is literally right there and because it is a ground. Alright, so there we go. We're done with just about all the wiring except that I have to fix This. Seven? Yeah. Oh. 
That makes my wiring just just barely fit. That could be a problem. Alright, there we go. Don't really like where those two are routed, but it's kind of a pain to reroute them. Best I can do is take my tweezers and try and coax them. All right. So from here, I am going to try powering this thing up and make sure that my wiring is correct because if there's any tweaks I have to do, I would really like to do it now. Where is the battery cover so that I can set this down? I don't know, here's another battery cover, so we'll use the one that I just dropped. Ooh, and I need, of course that doesn't, uh, I need a test run. Let me go find a test run. Fairly certain that's a test run. Ah, oh, yes. So, I got the buttons wired incorrectly. Nice. Left is left. That is good. Down is right. Right is right. Up is up. A and B are good. Start and select are good. And then this should be L and R. So I'm glad I checked this, but down, down's not right. Oh, it's not even shorting, it's just not making contact. The reason I'm getting left and right is because I'm hitting left or right. So down just doesn't work at all. Okay. That's fine, we can work with that. I forgot which way. It, ooh. It's fine. We'll just pretend that didn't happen. Alright, so down is TP7, which is this top one here. And it's entirely possible it's just not soldered on this side. Yep, that's exactly what the problem is. I'm not sure how that happened, but here we are. that around just to try and help with the wire management. I'm going to loop that around again. Or not, because it's staying where it wants to be. Fine. I can work with that. Alright, so now I need a power switch and a screen. this pair switch here looks like my battery fell out and the screen let me get a screen I'll go find a screen I'll be right back 
Okay, I went and pulled a uh, screen from my back stock here. It is a salvage screen, so it's a little um, not clean. I did my best to clean up the glass. Unfortunately, this is one of the uh, one chip screen kits, so the lens itself is not laminated to the LCD, so if we put any pressure behind the screen, we'll get uh, some Newtonian rings. I don't know how well that's coming out. You can see that spot. That's called a Newtonian ring. Um, so hopefully there won't be any pressure spots. I've got these two Game Boy Advance ribbons. Hopefully one of these works. These are tested but unlabeled, and I don't remember what the results of the test are, because they're unlabeled. And pop a battery in here. I should have used a battery cover that would screw down, but here we are. Right there. And here is the trick. I am going to use one of these uh, 32 pin to 34 pin adapters. The whole point of this stupid thing is so that you can plug in a 32 pin Game Boy Advance screen to your AGS 101 after you rip the LCD out for backlighting. Hey, these were made in 2005. Um, that's really not a good use for them anymore, but I mean, they're, it's not like the ribbons just went away. So try that out here instead of trying to make this whole custom nonsense screen but I will just use one of my test mules because it's working just have to take it apart it's annoying I had one test mule set to high brightness one to set to low brightness of course the low brightness one isn't working for whatever reason Salvaging the high brightness one. Ooh, good. The uh, solder pads are intact. And this is not one of the funny playing kits, but should be perfectly satisfactory for our uses here. What happened to the screen? Never mind. It's right here. I done found it. Alright, so... I'm gonna take a little bit of Captain Tape and stick this down. Oh, no, I'm not. I'm gonna fold this down, though. Oh, but I have to do the soldering first. Ah! <sighs> That will fit in there. And we need to solder. I'm gonna get some more ribbon here. We got one, two, three. I'm gonna run that down. Over. And I'll go back here so we have to slide. Oh, it's in the wires, huh? Okay. I'm getting nervous because I sit this wire, I should get more attention to the orders. I don't know which one's selected. One in the middle is R. I don't know which one's selected now. This one on this side is the bottom. You don't cross over. So this one should be selected. Wait, wait. Is that what we got? Are you seeing the opposite? So that's on the left. I can see. Okay, that's good. Work out. Work out.
Okay, so in order to avoid undoing my soldering here, I am going to test and see. Okay, so I want to solder to that corner, pad number one. These two, we need TP8 and TP9. TP8 is R, which is more than one. TP9, R, TP4. Uh-oh. I'm not sure which one is the test That one, okay. Oh, we just talked about this, that's fine. Please, that's there. That's fine. I always got to first. That should be the same thing over here. That goes into probably the other sister. Ooh, what do we got here? Where do we got that? Actually, that's just bad right there. Where do we got that? It's actually the fourth one. All right. I believe we are just about done. The only steps now are to sandwich this together and to get everything plugged in. So I'm going to get this plugged in up here. Had this worked out on paper, I swear. Uh, oh, <laughs> that's not supposed to come out. Alright, let's try that again. One of the problems is that these ribbons are just so freaking stiff they do not like to be bent I think the solution is to bend it anyway I might have to do like a little Z bend That should do it. No, that's not doing it. I think that should do it. So I've got two bends in the ribbon. You can see how it kind of flips around there. And then that fits like that. Well, it comes very close to fitting like that, but my power switch fell out. This is 
kind of a pain in the butt to put together. There we go. I think the key here is that we want to install this first. And I'm going to get some torque screws for that. I think that'll make my life so much easier. Oh, but of course I don't have them handy. Oh, but I did. I'm just dumb. These are not that size. Is that a T5 or a T6? That is a T6. They don't fit. Shoot. These are designed for two sets of screws. I'd have to drill that hole out. Alright, well, I guess. better off to use plastic threaded screws anyhow. this particular case I have a small bag full of Joy-Con screws because of course I do. And that's what I'm using. Oh, there we go. Okay. That was not a happy sound. I guess that's what I get for using Joy-Con screws. 
They're uh, knockoff Joy-Con screws nonetheless. Do I have a nice countersunk screw to use with that? But of course I don't. Because why would I have a countersunk screw? That's not going to work. Um, I don't know what to do about this predicament. I guess I'll just use a regular. Regular screw. Where's Y0, Y0, 0? I'm missing a bit. The bit that I need. That's convenient. Does that fit? That'll fit. It's not captive, but it'll hold. <laughs> That's nasty. But everything's working. So credit where credit is due. Oh, that's not even pressure on the screen. That's just this screen. Okay, well, I'll have to swap that out, but I really don't want to right now. So here is that cart that I said I was going to test and then never did. It's playing. It's just quiet. Well, there you go. There is the slab. Um, so how would I rate this? I, I know you guys are gonna ask. I gotta, I gotta cover it. Uh, that's not screwed down. Uh, let's compare it to my slate. It is the, almost the exact same height. It's actually slightly shorter. I'm impressed. It is quite a bit thicker though but that is because of how the cartridge slot is handled. There's really not a whole lot that can be done to fix that. I must have grabbed the wrong screen, that's what this is. I'll have to swap that out. Uh, let's just try Pokemon. I got a do something about my speaker because it doesn't quite fit right. I'm probably gonna just add a little bit of um, foam adhesive under the screw post there to hold it in place. Oh, it must have reset when I tapped it. Uh, yeah, I'm a little upset with the speaker, but that could be down to my speaker choice. Um, I'm not very happy with the fitment, I guess, but that could be down to, you know, this is this is PCB way printed. Um, 
Buttons are fine. I mean, it feels pretty much like a pocket, exactly like you'd expect. I don't really like the uh, recessed nature of the buttons, because when you press them down, they go kind of flush there. I think it would have been better if they were if they're a little bit taller. I think, Zypher, if you're looking for feedback, I think matching the aesthetic of the SP where you have the recessed buttons is fine when you're using SP buttons, but if you're using pocket buttons, I think it might be a little bit better to have those flush. Um, also, I think my screen ribbon is a little bit easier to use than yours. Oh, speaking of. Of course, my brightness control isn't working. That's unfortunate. I'm going to put that up to the ribbon. I don't know if brightness control ever worked on this ribbon, and unfortunately it isn't the one I wanted to use, so we may never know. But I don't know. Hard to say. I think I need more time with this thing really to judge it, but hey, you know, it's transparent. That's kind of cool, I guess. The link port should work, but unfortunately Zypher didn't include the um, the two little notches, so you can't use one of the wireless adapters unless you case mod that because of the uh, clips, which is a bit of a shame. There is enough room there, but I don't know. It is what it is. Yeah. I mean, it's it's pretty much what you'd expect. Real time for assembly. Uh, I don't know how long this video is going to end up being. As of right now, I've shot about two hours of footage, start to finish putting this thing together. Um, but like I said, I did some work on this before I even started filming, uh, mostly for the shoulder buttons and for the screen. Suppose we can fix that with some foam spacers too, but um, I don't know. I, I'd say all in all, I think this took me about four hours to assemble. Um, print time, I, I can't even begin to vouch for that since I ordered all the parts to print this, even though I have a 3D printer, I wanted, I wanted this aesthetic. It didn't come out the way I wanted it to, but it's all right. It's still usable. It's still good. Um, the print itself cost me, I think, about 60, 70 bucks with all the parts, which, I mean, isn't really that bad if you're building something like this. You know, you can get the Boggy Pickle, and that's going to run you over 100 bucks, this thing. And... You know what? I can't believe I didn't notice this before. These are the exact same thickness. <laughs> the screen portion on Zyphers is a little bit thicker, but the front shell is designed to work with the AGS-101 screen. If you want to, you just have to use a different back. Uh, so that's nice. Um, Boxy Pixels barely works with IPS kits as or at least that was my experience. Um, you know what? I like this thing. I think it's neat. I think you did a good job, Zypher. Uh, let's test some weird carts. The whole reason I wanted to build this thing was because I keep I keep talking about mine, comparing it to Boxy Pixels, and going, ooh, mine works with this cart, mine works with this cart. Oh, Zypher's might work with this cart. I have no idea if Zypher's works with those carts. Let's find out. So I went and grabbed pretty much all of the weird shaped carts that I have. Let's start with the Game Boy Camera because my slate and boxy pixels unhinged don't work with that. And unfortunately, Zyphers kind of doesn't. It doesn't clear, but there's enough wiggle room that you can just kind of jam it in anyway. And I mean, I guess it works. It's... Um technically compatible. 
<laughs> I don't I don't think that's necessarily worth Yeah. I don't know. It technically works. I'm going to I'm going to call it a no though. Um the e-reader Uh, oh, I had that backwards. If this went in this way, it would work. It doesn't. It goes in this way. E-reader's a no-go. Mine's still the only one that works with an e-reader that's not a stock SP. Um, let's try Game Boy Code Breaker. I think we're going to run into the same problem as the camera. Yeah. Yeah, but it'll it'll go. Yeah. Code breaker's fine. It's kinda sketchy though. The brain bore. That's perfectly fine. I know that works. Or you were twisted. It's a wider cart, but it clears just fine. If you have one of those, uh, Game Shark works fine. The MP3 play, ooh, it does not work if you want to use shoulder buttons. That uh, shoulder buttons don't clear. <laughs> And the Game Boy Advance Game Shark doesn't even come close. So yeah, there's some there's some limitations with this still. Uh, mine works with all of these. Um, unfortunately, Zypher's doesn't work with most of them. <laughs> uh, works fine with Wario or Twisted, but I think that's worked with everything so far. Um, one more thing. Oh. Test that. Oh, and of course I don't have it handy. Kirby's Tilt and Tumble. One of the motion adaptive carts. That'll work. That'll work great. See? Motion adaptive. I don't know how to play this game, but you'll have to take my word for it. So there you go, trade-offs. Oh yeah, definitely some trade-offs. Um, complicated to install, <laughs> tedious, yeah. I wouldn't call it complicated, definitely tedious though. Um, difficult, nah, 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 nah. I, don't, I don't think it's that difficult. The hardest part is still that ribbon, even though I, I, thought, I, I thought I was being clever, but it didn't work out too well still. Um, I don't know. There's there's little things I'd like to see improved, but otherwise, this is this is this is pretty solid. I like it. Um, of course, this is not being sold. Uh, the idea is he distributes the files for the print, and you either have it printed like I did, or print it yourself like I could have but didn't. Um, and then you assemble it. You need a common ground pocket board, which he does claim to sell, but I haven't quite figured out how to get them from him. Um, I kept following all the links and eventually they led back to his Instagram and I DM'd him on Instagram and I got, a, I, I got the boards that way, but I don't know if I got the boards that way because I'm Mako or because that's just how he sells the boards. Uh, there is a site that has popped up in the last few days, perhaps, uh, that is selling a kit to build one of these uh, that comes with the common ground and the two buttons and I think something else. I think it comes with one of my batteries, which, by the way, my batteries have a non-commercial license on them, so you're not allowed to sell them. Um, just throwing that out there. I will have to... I'll have to further investigate that, but um, there are exceptions, namely Retro Modding and Retro Game Repair Shop. I have licensed it to both of those 
people at both of those stores, but and their official resellers. Uh, but other than that, it's a non-commercial license. You're, you're not supposed to, whatever. That's not the point of this video. I'll that's my own problem that I'll work on later. Um, but yeah, I will. I'll throw a link to Zypher's video and his Thingiverse where he hosts this. Um, and as far as getting the board, I guess if he doesn't, if he doesn't have a storefront where he's selling them, which last I checked, they weren't on retro modding, even though retro modding sells some of Zypher's stuff. I don't, I don't know. This is a lot of rambling. Just check the description. There will be up to date links there. Um, otherwise I think that's, I think that's all I got. It's neat. It's definitely neat. I'll give it that. Uh, yeah. There you go. Thanks for watching. Have a good night. Oh! Actually, wait. Don't go yet. I'm sorry. I have one more quick addendum. I have done some work. Today is another day. Uh, I have put more work into this thing. Um, I fixed a few of the small little issues. Actually, most of my issues uh, were a result of me just not spacing things properly but anyway for the speaker it is now pretty much locked into place no longer fallen all i did was jam a small bit of foam between the speaker and the screw post uh looks like my foam is starting to work its way out already but i've had this thing apart a few times already since i've installed that so that could be related um next my screen falling in i have resolved that by also putting foam in between the screen and the back plate and you may notice while I'm back here I did change out the backlight kit that is in this thing I'm still using a Game Boy Advance kit not a Game Boy Advance SP kit uh, but I have perfectly working brightness controls you want to use the Game Boy Advance kit not the Game Boy Advance SP kit if you want to use brightness controls with select and L and R uh, even though the motherboard is the same for whatever reason the manufacturer puts different firmwares on the two uh, so if you have a kit that looks like this but it came with this ribbon these pads are disabled if it came with the other, the Game Boy Advance ribbons, then those pads should work, which is fine because you need the Game Boy Advance ribbon if you're using that other ribbon that I talked about earlier. And also, while we're there, I swapped out the screen uh, because the original screen, I believe that was actually my doing. I ruined it by putting those two spots in it because I was soldering to it while the, like I, I was soldering to the ribbon while it was sitting on top of the screen you can see here if we were to attach that and try soldering to it, flip it over, that's right about where my spots were. So I'm thinking that's my doing, so probably don't do that. Uh, but otherwise, once reassembled, it now seems to be, almost, seems to be working exactly as intended. There are still a few things, I keep going back and forth, uh, trying to clean up. I did go ahead and install that one screw in the battery compartment. I'd totally forgotten about that while I was reassembling it the first time. Swapped out the battery cover because, I mean, it's all the same. It doesn't really matter too much, but there you go. Now it is working as intended. I think my buttons are backwards compared to how I would like them, but that is not my fault. I wired it properly. It's just the kit itself that's backwards. So I can swap it out. I just haven't. Um, but there you go. It's all done. It's working. I think this is a, it's a pretty cool kit. Um, I think it needs a little bit more work before it's... Um, I don't know, 100% there. I think there, there's enough little things that are bothering me about it. Um, namely, I'd like to see future kit, future versions of this shell. 
I'd like to see these with uh, wall thicknesses of at least 0.8 millimeters. 0.6 is a little thin, it gets a little bit flexible. Um, also, I'm having fitment issues. There's a bit of a fulcrum on this, on these screw points, trying to attach it here. I mean, unfortunately, there's not a whole lot that can be done about that. That's just one of the constraints you have to work with with this style design. Uh, it's also probably quite significantly related to my material choice. This is very flexible uh, print. So, of course, I'm having fitment related issues. Um, I think that's pretty much it. Uh, oh, no, there's one more. I don't know that it's necessarily possible with this style design and retaining uh, compatibility with AGS 101 style screens, but I'd like to see this just a little bit thinner. Uh, maybe make the um, button plate and then the face plate, make that one piece instead of having these cutouts. Don't get me wrong, I appreciate the uh, aesthetic. Um, I think this does look pretty good, especially if you're using um, non-transparent prints. You know, you can print in two different colors. This design does lend towards uh, significantly easier printing, but my specific problem with it is when you press these buttons down, they go below the outer plate, and it's just, it's not the most comfortable thing. Uh, I think it would be a little bit more comfortable if the buttons weren't so recessed. Um, that said, it's not bad, I just think it could be better. All in all though, I'm very impressed with this. This is, this is a very, very talented design. I'm very pleased with the end result. Um, I, I, I think it's, I think it's pretty cool. They're, it's very apparent to me that a lot of work went into designing this thing. And if you couldn't tell from that long video, a lot of work goes into assembling one as well. Uh, but it's, it's neat. It's pretty cool. And while we're here, sorry, there's one more cart I have to test. I didn't even think to test it with the uh, other designs because I know this cart will work without having to flip the uh, cart slot over. But the rumble cart has a pretty significant rumble protrusion on the back. And unfortunately, it doesn't quite sit right. So back to my earlier point where I'd like I'd like to see a few more um, changes to this design before I'm ready to call it. Uh, I, I I don't know what I'm ready to call it, but there, you know what I'm trying to say. Uh, I think shifting the cart slot up a little bit more would be pretty good, or shifting the screen down. I don't know of a good way to do that. I think you'd have to put the buttons closer to the bottom, but I think I think that's kind of necessary because otherwise you can't use pinball, you can't use the camera, and the camera especially with a design like this, I feel like that's the bread and butter of this style design where you use those big carts that don't fit properly in a regular SP anyway. They can't really fit in here. Um, I mean, you can just jam it in and it does still work, but it's, it's flexing that joint that I was complaining about even more significantly. Um, also, I can see my power and charge LEDs because I have a clear case, but if I didn't have a clear case, all I'd see is light bleed. I think we could, I think that can be improved. But other than that, please believe me when I say this is actually a really nice design and I'm really pleased that I was able to get one built. Um, so go ahead and check out the links in the description. There will be um, more good stuff related to this. and. For those that came here for Slate News, I'm sorry, but you're going to leave disappointed because I don't have any. Uh, but anyway, this is 
This has been Zypher's Slab. Thanks for watching, guys. Have a fantastic night.